Hello, you are watching a replay of the Facebook Live. Today, my guest is Phil Twyford. He is Labour's spokesperson on housing, building and construction and local issues. He is also a social spokesperson on transport with a focus on Auckland and the ports. Phil has been in Parliament since 2008 and currently the member for Teatro Electorate. He is also the leading opposition voice on the housing crisis and Labour's reform agenda. If this is your first time and you want to learn more about property-related issues, then start now by subscribing to this channel. Phil, hello, how are you? Hi, Max, good to be with you. Thank you. Let's dissect your new rental policy. Have you heard the reaction um, of Andrew King from Property Investors Federation? Yes, I did. I, did. <laughs> I know Andrew pretty well. What do you think about it? I have had quite a lot. Well, I think um, I, basically, I think the reaction is kind of scaremongering from vested interests. You know, it's about time that uh, somebody stood up for the interests of 453,000 uh, families or households in this country who are renters. And um, we've got to a point in this country where renters should not be treated as second-class citizens. So I was disappointed to see Andrew King really scaremongering by saying that rents are going to go up and landlords are going to pull out of the market and all this kind of thing. It's, it's nonsense. It's time that we set some civilised standards for tenancy law in this country to ensure that the half of our population who are renters get a fair go. It's just not its not viable. We can't justify it in the 21st century that the half of the population who are renting have no security of tenure. So it's overdue to modernise our rental laws. And in fact, the package of measures that we announced yesterday are pretty similar to what's been done in Scotland and Ireland in recent years. Two countries that have quite similar uh, legal uh, systems to ours, similar rental markets, and um, in neither of those countries has the sky fallen in. Sure. He did have some valid points. Um, I think when he was talking about no cause termination, can you give some examples? How does it work currently and what you will stop? So currently the court termination in the, in the existing legislation allows landlords to terminate a tenancy with 90 days notice and no reason needs to be given. This is one of the things that contributes to um, the sense of vulnerability and impermanence uh, in the rental market. It gives renters a feeling that they can be terminated at any time, not for any particular reason. And it's one of the reasons why we have such uh, low levels of, of tenure security. You know, the average tenancy in New Zealand is 15 months. And in fact, sure. uh, about half of all tenants are 11 months or less. So this is just one of the measures. And what we've seen is that uh, we've taken away the no-cause uh, termination. But landlords can still, if there's a breach of contract, a breach of the tenancy agreement, for instance, uh, the tenant is breaking the joint, there's not paying the rent, um, then the landlord can still use a 90-day uh, termination, but with cause, or they can go to the tenancy tribunal and get a, a quick order if they need to get the tenants out faster. The other thing we've done, actually, is that our announcement yesterday we included that we're going to strengthen the provisions around antisocial behaviour. So if the tenants are making life miserable for the rest of the neighbourhood, loud parties constantly, noise call-outs, intimidating or bullying behaviour, then the Tenancy Tribunal can order an instant termination on that ground. And that would be an improvement on the, on the law that we currently have. I see. Another point that you've got in your new rental policy is that you have, a, you will require a formula for the rental increases. Who creates the formula? 
So I expect that uh, when we get legislation before the Parliament, we'll work through this in more detail. But we think it's uh, the reason for this provision is that um, we want there to be some transparency and accountability about future rent increases. And we think it's only fair that that be negotiated between the landlord and the tenant when the agreement is set. It gives the tenant some certainty. And I would expect that the, the, the formula would say, for example, um, that uh, it would make a link to market average, for example. Um, it might set a percentage band. Uh, and in the future, as now, the tenancy tribunal can intervene if a rent increase is unjustifiable or excessive. Um, so, uh, but we think that it would be fair and reasonable to ensure that that formula is agreed and in the agreement. So we're not trying to stop rent increases. We think mm -hmm. this might moderate them slightly, um, but we think it's important to give the tenants some uh, some advanced warning or advanced knowledge of what the increases, the order of the rent increase might be. I see. Uh, another thing that you would like to introduce is to um, to require all rentals to be warm and healthy. And obviously, everyone wants it to be. Well, most good. Most people want it, especially good landlords and all tenants. But isn't it the same what's currently been required by law uh, to be done by 2019? There are some, Max. Um, look, the first thing to say about this, I think, is that I think most people recognise the quality of that housing stock in New Zealand is very, very poor. And it's one of the main reasons why... 42,000 children are hospitalized every year with respiratory and infectious diseases. And in fact, 1,600 mostly older people die premature deaths every winter in this country because their homes aren't insulated and often they can't afford to heat them. So we, this is a very, very important public health. Most of them live in rental properties and many of those properties are still uninsulated and they're cold and damp and mouldy. What we want to do is set uh, tough minimum standards that will mean that the rogue landlords at the bottom of the market can no longer undercut good landlords by renting out slum housing that is cold, damp and mouldy and a threat to the health of the tenants. We want to set a level playing field and raise the bar so that uh, all they are to ensure that their houses are of a decent standard and not unhealthy for people to live in. So the current law that National legislated last year requires insulation and smoke alarms. But the insulation standard has a big hole in it. You could almost drive a truck through it. It, it says that if a property to the 1978 standard and that would require kind of insulation that is about, I don't know, about that uh, thickness, then yeah. that, property, that property then doesn't have to upgrade to the modern standard set in 2008 in the building code, which would be insulation about that thick. And that means several hundred thousand properties in New Zealand who are insulated to the old standard are not required to upgrade. Our policy and there's a bill currently before the parliament that recently was voted by a majority of MPs in parliament to support it would require not only a better insulation standard but it would also require that the that a, that a, a home be able to be in, um, to be heated to the optimum indoor temperature that the world describes between for instance 16 and 20 degrees uh, taking an account of insulation, um, having a modern heating source like a modern wood burner or a heat pump, ventilation, curtains, uh, the full range of, of things. And we think that that's a much better standard and it will um, make houses both warm and dry, excessive landlords. So what's if there is no easy access to insulate? Who's going to pay the cost to strip down the walls and insulate the walls. Do you require walls to be insulated as well? Well, that's, um, that's why we've, in, the, in the bill we've, we've tried to introduce a level of flexibility so that um, the, the house or the home 
must be able to be heated to the required standard, um, taking into account not only insulation, but the heating source, ventilation, uh, and that can affect a house. Now, if a property cannot be heated to that, uh, a decent range of indoor living temperature, then it shouldn't be being rented out. But let's say, we, but we have to be flexible about this. So, for example, there are some homes where it's very difficult to insulate the walls, but perhaps you can do ceiling and underfloor. And with a good heat insulation, on, hopefully you can reach the required indoor temperature range. Some properties, for example, you know, a well-designed um, and modern insulated apartment in Auckland probably doesn't need a heat pump. You know, a, a, a one or two bedroom apartment that's well designed, thermally efficient, wouldn't need a heat pump. So you've got to have some flexibility built into the system. I see. Will it the apply other thing, Max, you... I, should, I should point out. That... Sure. Go on, sorry. No, I'm just pointing out. Should... Yeah, so we are also, um, another part of our housing policy is that we're going to close down the negative gearing tax breaks for property investors. And um, that will generate um, about $150 million a year in additional tax revenue for the government. We're going to spend that money, which in the first 10 years will generate a fund of $1, spend that on retrofitting grants for landlords and owner-occupiers that would provide grants of up to $2,000 for, to um, retrofit properties with heating and insulation. So that will also um, help along the way, I think. So the majority of property investors and landlords in New Zealand are mom and dads, small uh, property investors that have one or two rental properties. They would say that you are punishing them for for being good landlords because now they'll have to bear the costs and then they won't be able to deduct the expenses from the income. So what would you say to this mum and dad's property investors? So Max, what, what I say to those uh, mum and dad investors is that um, Labor recognises that private landlords, including the mum and dad investors, play a very important role in our housing market and um, they're an important they, and service that they provide. And people who are wanting a stable long-term investment with a revenue stream based on the rent, who are genuine investors and, and landlords, uh, have nothing to worry about. What we're concerned about is the, the mania of property speculation that has been such a dominant force in the housing market, with people buying and selling houses simply for the capital gain. It's the definition of this we uh, squeeze the speculation out of the market, we will never ever fix the problems in this housing market. And our young people will never ever be able to have the, the dream of affordable home ownership. It's a necessary precondition to fixing the housing crisis that we squeeze the speculation out of the market. Under we won't see real gain of the kind that we've seen in, in Auckland particularly, but now increasingly in other parts of the country, of 10, 15, 20, and even 25% annual capital gain. Those days will be gone, Max. But that's not going to be a concern to small-time investors who are wanting a stable, long-term uh, investment, for instance, to, to support them in retirement, because they're not looking for those crazy year-on-year -year gains. Sure. Th this new rental policy from Labour, that doesn't apply to short-term tenancies like Airbnb, does it? Um, no, it doesn't. It basically ap applies to um, periodic tenancies and... And I think that this is a challenge that uh, governments all over the world are grappling with right now. Um, and particularly in places where the tourist economy is is a big deal, um, Airbnb's put very significant So you are basically creating unfair advantage to 
people that use Airbnb and by, by some measures there are thousands of them in New Zealand. Well, we don't know how, how big the Airbnb uh, market is. And um, I'm not sure anyone regulating Airbnb and its role and potentially destabilizing role in the housing market. And that's a challenge I think that we're all grappling with. But look, our policies are designed to modernize our rental market. New Zealand is an outlier internationally in how few rights that we give to renters. More than half the population in this country now rent. 453,000, and they live with anxiety and insecurity and poor quality housing that we just shouldn't tolerate in the 21st century. So this is about modernizing the law and trying to strike a better balance between the rights and obligations of both landlords and tenants. And I think we've got it about right. Sure. I had a question from Alex Kukala, who is asking, how are you going to increase the housing supply if currently it's, it's very hard to import prefabricated houses from other countries, which would help with the housing crisis? How would you tackle this difficulty with the importing prefabricated materials and houses and making sure they comply with the standards, obviously? Sure. So thanks uh, to Alex for asking that question, because um, the, the, the challenge of increasing housing supply is um, one of our greatest tasks. And there's a cable intends to tackle this. So one of them is by using the balance sheet of government and through government procurement to stimulate the construction of affordable homes for first home buyers. We have a housing shortage uh, in, uh, in New Zealand. We have a a, uh, an industry that uh, is very inelastic in the way that it um, responds to demand. The, the, the real estate market and the construction industry struggle to, um, to meet um, demand in a way that is um, almost uh, hard to understand, actually. The re the, the, there is such a big gap between the supply and the demand. But one of the ways we're going to tackle the government's balance sheet to stimulate through our Kiwi Build policy, to stimulate the construction of, of affordable homes for first home buyers. That will house a new generation of young New Zealanders, but it will also add on top of what the private market is already building. It, on top of that, it will add an injection of supply into the market. You know, in the last few years, while Nationals been in government, a, a shortfall in Auckland has built up of more than 40,000 dwellings. That's one of the things that's drives. And the other problem we've got is the private market is building, you know, the new builds that are being delivered by, by the private market, fewer than 5% of them are considered to be affordable. And that's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's young people simply can't find somewhere affordable to buy. So we're going to build those houses. We're going to borrow $2 billion, use it in fund. It's a capital injection at the start of a 10-year program. By the end of that 10 years, we will have built 100,000 homes. The money will have been recycled about 20 times, and it's fiscally neutral. The taxpayer comes out. Uh, the other big supply uh, policies that we have is that we're going to use, we're going to set up an organisation called the Affordable Housing Authority, building roads, but it's going to build affordable homes. It will cut through the red tape and build large quantities of affordable homes in new master-planned urban developments. So imagine something on the scale of Hobsonville or Tamaki, five, 10,000 new dwellings in master-planned new communities like New Lynn, like Avondale, like Henderson, like Monaco, with a range of different affordable um, uh, price brackets different kinds of housing, terraces, apartments, flats, with the government investing in infrastructure, transport and other infrastructure, in a master planned um, community with all the resources and amenities that, um, that people need. And the 
And at the moment, we have a highly restrictive planning system that chokes off the supply of new land for development. It drives up urban land costs so that developers simply don't want to build affordable homes on incredibly expensive urban land. So we have rules and it'll fix a broken system for financing infrastructure. So we're going to we're going to tap into international bond finance, 50, 60 year bonds, 2% sure. interest. Sure. Government will then package that money up and make it available for new, for infrastructure for new developments serviced by a target cap for infrastructure finance in a way that's simply not happening right now and will mean it will allow our city to grow. I see. I see. I, I think I think Alex was asking more about Alex was asking houses and how you can import them from China or Europe or the States. How can you fast track this process? Because currently there are big Moving companies that do not want it because they make a lot of money from slow and I imagine processing is easy. Yes, my apologies. I got uh, I went off on a tangent there. My apologies. So, um, one of the opportunities that the Kiwi Build program allows that new um, uh, design and technology and production processes have been so slow to come into the New Zealand market is that not only is our market small, but it's incredibly fragmented. Most homes in this country are built by uh, small and medium enterprises the approach to building houses. Two or three guys out on the weather for months on end building a, ha a house from scratch. With Kiwi Build, we're going to be tendering the work to companies that can scale up. They'll be, we'll be tendering a year with a multi-year contract technology to do prefabricated uh, off-site manufacturing, panelization, and all of the um, supply chain and production processes that can deliver better quality homes at a more So that scale you allow us to make the big breakthrough that Alex is asking about. I see. We have another question from Kiran. Can you see this question, uh, Phil? Yes, I can. Yeah. That's right. So Kiran asks a very good question. Um, the government, the national government, has basically been running um, an open door immigration policy. Net, net migration has quadrupled in the last few years. It's running several times higher than it is in the UK per capita and several times higher than it is in, the, in Australia per capita. At the same time, there's a, a set of policies that stop Auckland from growing as our biggest city hasn't been able to grow properly because of the housing policies and the failure to invest in infrastructure. Um, you, can, you can hardly drive across town because there's so much congestion on the roads. So... We think that while we get those policies sorted out, it would be wise to rebalance the immigration policy. So we've proposed that we can we can reduce the net current net migration to running at over seventy thousand a year. We believe we can reduce that by about twenty to thirty thousand while the infrastructure catches up. This is not about blaming migrants uh, for our problems. Actually, the problems are created by bad policies. <laughs> by successive government. But in the meantime, we think we can ease back on the, on the level of migration while still ensuring the economy gets the skilled workers that it needs, including for construction. Um, but let's, uh, uh, the problem we've got in Auckland is I think it's graphically illustrated by the housing problems. Um, in the last 12 months, Auckland's population grew by about 45 to 50,000. But in the last 12 months, only 7,000 new homes were built. Now, we need at least 14,000 to keep up. But 7,000 new homes, how is that going to house 
50,000 extra people. There's the mismatch. It's one of the reasons that um, that uh, housing, uh, we have undersupply, too much demand, and that's what's been driving prices so high. So if you look at the migration numbers, um, it consists of students, Kiwis coming back to New Zealand, and skilled workers. Who are you going to cut? There are two areas where we believe we can improve the quality of the immigration program. One is in the international uh, education sector. There are too many um, uh, private training establishments who are providing sub-degree courses, so diplomas and certificates and so on, who are really not providing a quality product. What they're providing is a scam. It's a rort which provides people with a backdoor entry for visas and residents. It's damaging the reputation of our country and damaging the reputation of an ind a valuable export industry. So we believe that um, by, by um, uh, subjecting some of those private training establishments to a quality audit by NZQA, we will shut down some of those programs that don't meet those standards. The second is that we believe that too many employers have been allowed, instead of paying a decent wage to, news, to local workers, they've been allowed holus bolus to bring in to import cheap migrant labour on a high churn model. That has have, have the effect of depressing wages. We want to grow wages in New Zealand. So many of our problems are related to the fact that we are a low wage low productivity economy, allowing employers to constantly bring in um, uh, cheap, high churn overseas labour is contributing to our problems. So now we have to find the right balance because there are many industries that, that have genuine skills shortages and we need to bring in uh, skilled workers. But Max, our priority should be to grow and train the workforce in New Zealand and to raise living standards, raise productivity, and wa raise wages. So those are the two main ways that we think we can turn the dial back a little bit on um, net migration, take pressure off infrastructure, particularly in Auckland, and actually uh, reduce the extent to which immigration has been depressing wages. Uh, Phil, there is a question from Lucia. She's asking, should the developer contribution to be based on the size of the property to create more affordable housing because it will reduce the costs for a smaller property, right? Yeah, that's a really good suggestion from Lucia. I mean, it's a at the moment currently the way that these development contributions are levied. Um, they actually it's a disincentive to for intensification, and uh, and they effectively encourage these large and expensive uh, dwellings to be built. So I think there are a number of things that we can do to um, to look at incentivizing more efficient land use in the way that Lucia is suggesting. But look, one of the, our proposals to ch change the way that infrastructure is financed would see, um, would actually, we wouldn't need development contributions anymore because um, the infrastructure for a new development, instead of being built by the council and then the council charging development contributions to the developer, the um, infrastructure would be funded through um, infrastructure bonds paid back by a targeted rate on the properties in that development over the lifetime of the infrastructure asset, even 50 to 60 years. If we do that, we actually don't even need to charge in, uh, development contributions in the first place. What our proposal would do is um, take the burden off developers of being the financing vehicle for, for new infrastructure. Because actually, it, it not only does it add huge cost to new, to new homes that have been in a new development, but also it adds a lot of risk and time and expense to a development because uh, sometimes, you know, smaller or medium sized developers are having to access capital and act as a, as a financing vehicle um, for, for, you know, large sums of money to finance infrastructure. Sure. Have you thought about moving the government departments and other state-owned enterprises from big cities like Value 
rural towns to ease their congestion, to remove this housing pressure? We have. We've given quite a lot of thought to that. And, uh, and you know, Labor puts a lot of emphasis on, on regional development policies that will encourage sustainable business growth and job growth in the regions. And I'm, I'm constantly reminded of this because whenever I'm talking publicly about fixing Auckland's transport problems and building more affordable housing, people in the regions ring me up or email me and say, I don't want to finance Auckland's growth. We have plenty of houses down here. We don't have any traffic problems. We just need more jobs. Thank you very much. And I understand where they're coming from. That's why we have to make sure that Auckland's growth is self-financing. We have to find ways of financing Auckland's growth that don't just rely on hitting up the taxpayer and the taxpayers who live in the other parts of New Zealand. Um, so we need to, we need good regional economic development. But even if we do that, Max, that won't solve Auckland's growth problems because urbanisation is a powerful force. It's happening all over the world. It's been going on for 100 years. It's going to go on for another 50 to 100 years. I think the experience internationally is that it's very hard to stand in the way of urbanisation and the attractive force of large cities. Auckland is our only major city in New Zealand. It's an international gateway for us. It's, it needs to be a high productivity, prosperous and dynamic economy that will generate benefits for the whole of New Zealand. So I don't want to stop Auckland's growth. And I believe that if we adopt the right policies, Auckland can grow much more successfully and generate more prosperity that will be an advantage for the whole country. So with good policies, Auckland can uh, grow much more successfully and share the benefits. You know, there are um, the current government would like everybody to think that these problems of growth in Auckland, expensive housing and gridlock on the roads, are problems of success, that all cities, successful cities, have these problems. And it's it's simply not true. There are many cities, including, you know, a lot of cities in the United States, for example, um, that are bigger than Auckland with a faster growing population, and they have housing that is three times more affordable. There are so many so cities in the world. Sorry to interrupt. So, so what would be your answer, yes or no? Do you think we should move the state on enterprises and government departments to rural cities? Because anything would help, right? That any bit will help. Sure. Um, I think we can move um, uh, some government services uh, and government departments could easily be moved to other parts of the country. And we, we are actively exploring exactly uh, that policy now. In this, mo in this modern connected world, it's perfectly possible for some government agencies and uh, and uh, government departments to be based in, in in cities around regional New Zealand. I think there's no there's no reason why we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Currently, some politicians have property investments. Some of them have up to ten, twelve properties. Do you think there is a conflict of interest, and should we ban politicians from owning more than <coughs> one property investment? Well, I think when you look like at this, yeah, you know, all of the property uh, interests are transparent these days. They're all on the website of Parliament. Anybody can go and see the properties. The current um, social housing minister, Amy Adams, owns eight properties. The uh, the National Party MPs uh, own far more properties than the other parties um, and have an average of about three properties per person. So I think the public can can legitimately ask the question, is there a connection between uh, multiple property ownership by National Party MPs and the fact that they are steadfastly opposed to any tax reform that would tax uh, property ownership? They have refused to do anything for nine years to rein in property speculation that has been so damaging in our economy and, and to home ownership. That I think that's a fair question to ask. So what's your personal opinion? Should politicians have an interest in any kind of business that they have influence on, especially in the industry that they're working in? I don't think I, – I wouldn't be in favour of that, um, Max. I think that would be a bit draconian. But I do think the fact that we have transparency now 
property interests are readily available. Anyone can look them up on the web, on the parliamentary website and see how many properties people own. For me, that's that sunlight is the best disinfectant. I see. Lucia has another question for you, Phil. Um, do you understand the difference between property investors and property speculators? And who yeah. do you support? <laughs> Thanks, Lucia. I would, uh, to my mind, the, def the definition of a property speculator is someone who's simply in it for the capital gain, who is farming the capital gain. A property investor, uh, and we spoke before about mum and dad investors, I think a part of a sustainable industry that is based on long-term uh, yield, based on the rental revenue. And that, for me, that's the difference. And we want to see property investors who are there, who are providing a good service as landlords and are, and are, and are legitimately uh, uh, have a long-term stable investment. But look, there are people who've been making a killing on the property market. We've seen extreme cases of flipping where people have sold properties on the same day they've on-sold them and pocketed half a million dollars in profit. Um, we now have a, a property, um, residential property in New Zealand is now worth a trillion dollars. It's the, the size of our residential property um, holdings in New Zealand compared to the share market or compared to our GDP are so disproportionate, far more disproportionate than they are in Australia, the UK, or the United States. It's a sure. cancer in our, in our economy, and we have to fix it. We have to get back to uh, um, we have to get back to an industry that builds things of value, and is not just based on property speculation. We need an industry that provides good, high quality, safe housing for people to live in. We cannot go on with an industry that's based on housing as an investment class, that is a commodity in a global real estate market. That is terribly damaging to the well-being of our country. Okay. Phil, you are a very busy person and I uh, appreciate for your time to answer questions from other concerned property owners and uh, tenants. Would you have a couple of minutes to uh, stay around after our conversation so you could answer additional questions if people have in the comments on Facebook? I'd be happy to do that, Max. And, and thanks for everybody who's uh, uh, sent in questions so far. And, and Max, I really appreciate you having me on your, on your show. Thank you for your time, Phil, and uh, all the best with your campaign. And uh, maybe we can talk again later. I would like that. Look forward to it. Thank you, Phil. See you. Bye.